could ever shake us we're dancing now we're dancing now upon the rock of revelation we're dancing now we're dancing now no enemy could ever shake us we're dancing now we're dancing cause he rejoices he rejoices over us yes he Come on, this is what we're confessing. This is our God we're talking about. Come on, this is a declaration. You can tell your enemies, listen, this is my God. This is my God. Let's stand on this today. Come on. Like a mighty fortress, he's our God. Like a mighty fortress, he's our God. When enemies surround us, rising like a flood, come on, they break into pieces, swallowed in. Shake 
Your love is undefeated. 
the splendor of a king clothed in majesty let all the earth rejoice all the earth rejoice he wraps himself in light darkness tries to hide it trembles at his voice it trembles at his voice how great is our god sing with me how great is our god oh we'll see how great how great is our god
name above all names. Come on now. Anything you're facing today, come on. He's the name above it all. Yeah. Name is our God. Sing with me. Oh 
the goodness of God. Cause all my life you have been faithful. Oh, yes. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, and I will sing. The goodness of God, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Yes. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Yes. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life. Hello, hello, hi. (laughs) 
I was reading this morning, God brought this verse to my mind this morning. We all know this verse in Romans 8. It says, and I am convinced. And to be convinced means nothing is going to persuade you otherwise. Nothing. You're convinced. You know. I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can yeah. separate us from God's love. No power in the sky, above, or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever tried to argue with someone who's convinced of something. <laughs> it's hard. You're not going to persuade them otherwise. You might as well give up. <laughs> Come on. We need to be convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that our God is for us. Our God loves us. There is nothing, not angels nor demons, nothing. The powers of hell cannot prevail against the love of our Lord. When you're convinced of that, when you know I don't know. I don't I don't know what's got a hold of like if you've got something that's got your heart instead of Jesus, I don't know if it's an addiction. I don't know if it's your television. Come on. Come on. When you are convinced that of the love of our Father, that stuff that you don't need it. Yeah, come on. It doesn't matter. It doesn't hold you anymore because you know I am convinced. When you get up the morning, say, I am convinced of the love of my Father. I am convinced that He has plans for me, a hope and a future. I am convinced that I will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Wake up every morning, whatever you read, say, I am convinced of this love. I am convinced of his plan. I have hope. I have a future. So when you're singing this song, when Ashton's leading this song, his goodness is running after me. I am convinced his goodness is running after me. I am convinced it's there. I will see his goodness. I have seen his goodness in this land of the living. It's not just for when we get to heaven. His goodness is now. It's already been given. We have everything. We have what he says we can have. We are who he says we are. Be convinced. Don't be persuaded otherwise by whatever's going on. I am convinced of his goodness. His goodness is running after me. Thank you, Jesus. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. With my life laid down. Surrender now, I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now, I give Of the goodness of God, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God, yes, I will sing of the goodness of God, yes, I will sing of the goodness of God, oh, I will sing of the goodness
Praise the Lord. Um, I just want to finish that. That song's not finished. But I just wanted to share a story with you. Um, if you have an unsaved loved one and, or if you have somebody out there that's wandered off course, Richard shared last night how he had gotten away from the Lord. But this morning, I heard about a guy in uh, Grand Falls, Newfoundland, and he grew up in the church. He was faithful in the church. And then when he got into his 20s, he got away from the Lord. And stayed away for years and years and years. And um, last Monday, last Monday, the pastor decided to go and visit him, discerned to go and visit him. And he stayed with him for a while, and they just talked. And the guy said he hadn't been feeling really well lately. But anyway, as, as the pastor was leaving, he turned around and said, would you like to say the sinner's prayer? And the guy said, yeah, I really would. And so he prayed with him, and then he left. By Wednesday, nobody had seen this guy, and they found him. They found out that he had died Monday afternoon, dropped dead in his house. But when I heard the story, it's like, you better know that God answers prayers. He might not answer them in your time in the way that you think that he ought to, but he, he's faithful. Be convinced of that. Be convinced of his faithfulness towards you and towards your loved ones, and stop sweating. You know, the, the, in the Old Testament, they had to wear linen garments. The reason why they had to wear linen garments is because the Bible says God hates sweat. You know, what he's saying about that is he hates human effort. He wants you to trust him. It, covenant is all about trust. Covenant is all about trust. It's about giving him your time, giving him your talents, giving him your treasures as he's given you his time, his talent, and his treasure, and just resting in that. Come on, Hebrews 4, 11 says, labor for one thing only to enter into his rest. Because verse 12 says, for the word of God is alive and powerful. So you enter into his rest by meditating the word, not by meditating your circumstances. Amen. Praise the Lord. Me sing a solo right now, or would you like to at the end of the service? Okay, good. <laughs> Just do it, it's for you. <laughs> no, no, you have, to, you have to be the song. <laughs> Don't do a new one, do that one. Oh, it's yeah, working. yeah, yeah, we'll do that one. fails me and all my days I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God come on sing it from your heart I love you Lord Oh, your mercy never fails me And all my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God yeah. Cause all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I love you have led me through the fire and in darkest night you are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend and I have lived in the good 
goodness of God. Oh, control my life, you have been faithful. Oh, and all my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing. The goodness of God, I will sing of the goodness of God. Mm -hmm. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. night you said stop running if his goodness is running after you just stop running yeah come on <laughs> turn, around. Turn, around. <laughs> turn around and catch it come on you know Deuteronomy 28 and verse 1 says that if you hearken diligently on the voice of the Lord your God and observe to do what he says these blessings will come upon you and overtake you and so that, that's basically what that song is talking about is God want, God's blessings we're not chasing the blessing we're chasing the blesser. When you get your focus on the blesser, the blessing will overtake you. If you chase the blessing, you'll be running for it all your life, right? So um, Ashton was going to pray over the offering before she took off. She ran too quick, so praise the Lord. You know, you can't know the law. She's up here on the platform, right? You just get, it, get it all. <laughs> Father, we give you glory. We give you glory, Father. We give you honor and praise in every area of our life, Father. We give our tithes and offerings joyfully, Father. We sow it joyfully today, knowing that it's going forth, it is producing a harvest, Father. Not only that we shall reap, Father, but that this community will reach, Father. Mm. That this, this nation will be reached, mm. Father, by the seed that is sown here in this place. Father, this is your work, and we are so joyful and happy to give into it. We give you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor, and we stand on your word. Like Stephen said last night, we walk on your word today, mm. knowing that it will go forth and it will produce, Father. Amen. We praise you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Kiddos. How you oh all back God. there in the sound booth? Everybody look at the people in the sound booth. You're doing a good job back there. They're doing great. Amen. These guys are doing a good job, too. By the way, if you don't know it, it's Bella's 16th birthday today. She's getting her <laughs> driver's license later on this afternoon. Don't no, actually, that's about eight years away, but eight years are like a, a moment in time. And so, so. Yes, happy birthday, Bella. And there's the stars of Facebook that were down to see all the animals the other day. <laughs> we were down there with you, yeah, in Facebook, yeah. Behold the church of tomorrow. And the church of today. <laughs> Do you know what? Actually, I, I uh, just a quick thing. I, um, we led worship at a kid's church, a uh, kid's camp one time. And it was 5 to 12. And don't discount that the power of God can hit that place. It was a mighty, mighty move of God that happened that night. And children were just weeping before the Lord. And we just pray that, Father. We pray that right now, that as they go to Sunday school, Father, that your glory will follow them. It will impenetrate everything that they have today. Father, we just bless the teachers. We thank you for their time. We thank you for their effort. And we thank you for the anointing that is on them to reach these children. 
We just give you all the glory for their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I'm going to get you to uh, turn in your Bibles to. That's the Holy Ghost. See, she wants to be led by the Holy Ghost. She's waiting. So. I think we're going to go to Matthew chapter chapter six. But before we go there. I, we need to talk about the building again because we have a crew coming in this week to do some more work on it. And, um, and, we're, and why would you do that, Pastor? Well, I read Isaiah 61 one time, and that's where Jesus quoted, he, he quoted it in Luke 8, 4, 18 and 19, of the Spirit of the Lord's upon me and anointed me. But he, let, you know, he stopped at the acceptable year of the Lord and left the rest for us. And the rest for us, you know, talks about uh, talks about repairing the wasted cities, it, building building back things that have been torn down. Right. And so this building, whether you appreciate it or not, God invested several hundred thousand dollars of his money into it. And then the people that were in charge of it ran out of money. And instead of God moving us into the building of our dreams, he moved us into to this place. And it's producing good fruit. Y you know, uh, but it is ongoing, and I, and and I know that there's, you know, th but but again, I I believe this. He said he said they'll they'll he said they'll be ministers of our God, they'll be priests of our Lord, and they'll build the old waste. They'll raise up the desolations, repair the wasted cities and the desolations of many generations. Then strangers will come and feed their flocks. The sons of the ill and the beautiful are plowmen and vine dressers. I mean, it's, it's, it's a promise there. You know, when God leads you, sometimes he'll lead you through the valley of the shadow of death. I'm not saying this building is that, but, but when we first walked in, we were convinced it was. And, and, uh, and we've been working on it ever since and spending his money repairing it, and uh, will we be here forever? Probably not, and if we did, we would have to get, anyway, so it's a whole other story, but I want you to know that we're here by the will of God, and, uh, and, and so we're going to stay here until he leads us elsewhere, and uh, I can complain about it, which I have, <laughs> but, but you know what? He, he's so faithful, he's never... I can look back over the years of my life, and he has not one time ever failed. I am convinced. I am like Paul the Apostle. I am fully persuaded that what God has promised, he's also powerful to perform. You need to get fully persuaded, people. So anyway, um, I, I just want to talk a little bit about tithes and offerings, only because this page fell out of my Bible. Like I read most of the time, I read on my iPad, but my Bible still falls apart for some reason or another. Uh, and it's time, uh, actually, I have a new one. I don't know, but I can't, I, I need to write notes in my Bible. I need to mark it all up, and, and, uh, and I can't do that comfortably on my iPad. So, so I'm going to use a paper Bible until Jesus comes. If it offends any millennials, I apologize for that. But <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, now, consider, now, now, how many of you know that the Hebrew alphabet, this is not the message, this is just, this is the bonus round, okay? The Hebrew alphabet, the Aleph Bet, is not like ours. Ours is A, B, C, and there's this, you know, Aleph, uh, you know, Bet, Tav, and so, you know, a whole, you know Gimel and all. And anyway, we're not going to get into the teaching of the Hebrew language here this morning. But we are going to teach a little bit today. I feel like I haven't taught in years. And so, I'm going to put a little bit of a teacher hat on this morning. But anyway, the Hebrew alphabet... We have an alphabet, A, B, C, D. They have an alphabet, but their alphabet is all their, also their numerical system. So they don't have one, two, three. They still have the Aleph and the Tav, right? So, so, and, and so each letter has a grammatical value, and this is how, when they were writing the Bible, this is how you, you got the Bible. When they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, they were just like, almost like your King James Bible, because what you do is you write from the right to the left, and when you get to the end of the line, you add it up. 
And then you add it up each line until you get to the bottom of the page. And if the numerical value is not the same as what you've written, you tear it up and start over again. It had to be written accurately. It has, and it has to be uh, in, understood accurately too and it has to be spoken accurately too because if you understand anything about covenant, you can't run ag against your giant with your mouth shut. You know, if you've got a circumstance in your life, you've got to talk to it. Jesus, you know, Jesus talked to the fig tree. Do you ever wonder why he talked to the fig tree? The first covenant he made in the garden was with Adam and Eve. And he said, and, and eight, there's eight covenants in the Bible, and, and two of them are conditional. The other six are unconditional. But the first one that was conditional is if you eat from that fig tree. It's like you're going away for the weekend and you tell your kids, you can have everything you want in the fridge, but don't touch the car. I guarantee you that they'd be thinking about the car the whole time. The temptation had to be there. In order for you to be a free moral agent, there had to be a choice. And he chose the fig tree. Also, the fig tree represents Israel, if, if you understand your Bible. But also, Jesus cursed the fig tree because of what it brought on mankind so that the mankind would never be cursed again. There's all kinds of things like that in the Word of God. But, 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 but. So, the numerical value of the Hebrew word rich, Asher, is 580. The word for a poor person is Ani, A-N-I. It equals 130. The difference between the two of them is 450, which is the numerical value of the Hebrew word tan, which means to give totaling 450. So the difference between rich and poor is the difference between, between benevolent giving and not giving at all. So it's even in the word that way. But then in Matthew chapter 6, I know we've looked at Matthew chapter 6 a lot of times, but you can live there. If you can get Matthew chapter 6, you, you, you'll have a good life. <laughs> you know. But in Matthew chapter 6, Verse 33, he says, but seek when? Third? Second? First. The kingdom. Okay, what is the kingdom? Romans 14, 17 makes it clear. His kingdom is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. So, if you, so righteousness, peace, and the joy in the Holy Ghost is your experience in life. That's God's intention for you. Then when the disciples said, Jesus, teach us to pray in Matthew chapter 6, 13, he said, or 9 through 13, he said, pray this, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth, not on earth, in you as it is in heaven. God wants you to live like you're already there. How many of you are experiencing that right now? And if you're not, there must be some tweaking required, right? But he says, he says you know, seek first the kingdom of God and his Righteousness. Now, he lists all the things that are necessities of life before he gets to this. He, tell, you know, he says, you're working for the necessities of life. But he said, I want to talk to you about covenant. I want to talk to you about covenant. A covenant is Genesis 8, 22, as long as the earth remains. Seed time, harvest time. Covenant is, you give me your time, you give me your talent, you give me your money or your treasure, and, and I'll give you mine. The more of yours that you give me, the more of mine I'll give you. It's true whether you like, you know. That, but anyway, this word, this word, this word righteousness, if you think about it in, in the Greek, we understand one thing. But if you look at it in the Hebrew, it, it takes on a little bit of a different meaning because it's zedek or zedekah. And, um, well, example in Joel chapter 2. He said, I'll give you the former rain and the latter rain, and the latter rain was more Zedekah. More Zedekah means righteous teacher. Then if you go to Abraham giving ties to Melchizedek, Melchi is king, and Zedek is righteousness, so he was given his tithe to the king of righteousness. But when we think of righteousness, we think of right standing with God, and, and that's true, but, but it's more than that in the Hebrew. It's more than that. So this, this word zedek in the Hebrew, it means fairness. 
It means his way of giving to those that have been denied justice. I wrote that down. So when he's saying, seek his righteousness, he's saying, seek my way of giving to those of you that have been denied justice, that the, to those of you that have been treated unfairly. So what he's saying is you need to begin to think covenant, not need. You're not need-minded, you're seed-minded, but you're thinking about his, he's a covenant-keeping God. He said, you've been denied justice. He said, I want to give you covenant faithfulness. Really what he's saying here, uh, this is the Gary Hooper translation, but you can check it out for yourself. Seek first his righteous acts. Seek him first in kindness. Seek him first in abundant supply. Seek him first in gracious acts. Seek him first in deliverance. This is what he wants for you. He wants all of that for you. And that's why, well, I'm, I'm going here, everywhere here. We'll see where we end up. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 43 first. And so we'll see something over here in Isaiah 43. I mean, really, seriously, you don't think he needs your money, do you? I mean, come on. No, but here's what I have observed as a pastor for 27 years. People will spend more money at Pizza Hut than they'll put an offering plate and wonder why their life isn't blessed. Right? Like, that's a no-brainer to me. If I love, and, and, and I'm not giving out of religious obedience. I'm giving out of honor and respect for who he is. I'm not trying to obey some religious law, tithes and offerings. Matter of fact, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 says, I'm under grace now. But he said, pray that you get the grace of giving because he that sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He that sows bountifully will reap bountifully. I remember one time we were in the Annapolis Valley in a Bear River and uh, reading the history of the place. And, and back in the day, they used to build ocean-going ships there on the river. And when the tide came in, they'd float them out. And they would send those boats out. And everybody in the town was involved in the building, from the guys that held the lumber to the guys that put the groceries on the ship. And when they went out, they knew that when it came back from its voyage, that their ship would come in. That's where that saying came from. And so lots of times people are believing God for their ship to come in, and you never sent the ship out. <laughs> you believe in God to bless you financially, and, and you've been tipping to him all your life and spend all. See, because when I look at my treasure or my, or my finances, I can see what my God is. Because he said, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. So if I can look at my checkbook and see I spent all my money on me, or my, all my money on a motorcycle, or all my money on a house or something, and I've been tipping God. He said, the first fruits. He said, honor me with the first fruits of all of your increase, not with what you have left over. In other words, if I don't honor him with the first, I've dishonored him. It's, it's, it's just the way it is, right? And so now I'm praying and saying, God, show up in my life. And he's saying, why don't you show up in mine? I'm not after your money. I'm after your heart, and your heart is connected to your money. Your heart is connected to your talent. Are you going to spend your talent for me? Or are you going to spend your time for me? And don't think you can substitute one for the other. Time for treasure. Time for talent. No, it's all three. It, 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 requires, all, it, be, it requires all of you. That's what communion is all about. We take communion once a month. We never think about it. But you're, he submitted his body, a dead sacrifice, and he said, submit your body unto me, a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable unto me is my reasonable service. So when I'm taking communion, I'm recognizing that he died for me so that I would live for me. Live for who? Am I really living for him? I come to church when I feel like it. <laughs> I don't feel like it today. I'll never forget the Philippines. Pastor Paul and I and Carla were over there one day. And a monsoon came through and flooded the river up in front of the church. And it's 7 o'clock service, 7 o'clock in the morning. Everybody was wet from here down because they wouldn't let a flooded river stop them from going to church. Is it raining? Well, I, you know, I had a busy week and I'm tired. You tell your flesh it's tired, it'll get more tired every time you speak to it. Uh -huh. now, I, I, let's go to Isaiah 43. You got to lighten up, Gary. They're, they're shrinking in their seats here. Okay. <laughs> Verse 25 of Isaiah 43 says, He blots out 
your transgressions for his own sake. He does not remember your sins. That's good, too, because if he doesn't remember your sins, why do you? Huh? When are you going to set yourself free? When are you going to let yourself, you know, when are you going to let yourself out of jail? The jail door is open. Jesus opened the door, and you're still in there saying, uh, I, again, I like, I like what Peter did. Peter denied Jesus three times. I don't like that, but I've denied him more than that, and so have you. <laughs> yeah, but, but 50 days later, on the day of Pentecost, he stood up and preached to 3,000 people, and he wasn't up there thinking, <laughs> I'm so unworthy to preach to all these people. I denied the Lord Jesus three times. What, 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 what do I have to share? You don't live there, people. You, you're living in his grace and his truth. You're living, when he says he forgives your sin and won't remember it anymore, you need to get a good forgetter too. Matter of fact, his mercy is new every morning, so maybe you need his mercy today for something that happened yesterday. Just get, just take it. Don't, don't let it ruin another moment of your, don't let guilt and shame ruin another moment in your life. Don't let it. Go to 1 John 1, 9, confess it, and he said he'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You know, when we say get over it, it sounds so simple and it annoys people, right? Because it's more complicated than that. Yeah, it is, and no, it's not. <laughs> it's complicated because your mind's all mixed up. But if you new, renew your mind by the word of God, you, you, you can, when, you, when you mess up, when you make a mistake, how many mistakes do you think they have to make a movie? How many outtakes do you think they have just to make one movie? They spend months making a movie that you're going to watch for two hours because there's so many mistakes and outtakes. And, uh, and, and so it is in life. So it is in life. We, we're, we're, we're perfect in the eyes of the Lord and walking it out in our flesh, right? Okay. So, but here he says, the next verse he said, he said, put me in remembrance let us plead together, declare that, you may, that you'll be justified or that you'll be right. Well, you know, he didn't forget. He didn't forget, right? So he's saying, don't you forget. Don't you forget who you are in Christ. Don't you forget who he made you to be. No, no, well, yeah, that's okay. We can go there. I think I already looked at that earlier today. Let's go to... Um, Deuteronomy, no, yeah, Deuteronomy chapter 30. This is a covenant that God made. This is one of the covenants that he made with Moses. This is covenant number four. You might want to mark that at the top of the chapter because I'm going to cover these eight covenants over the next little while. Because we are in, you know, we are in the season of Teshuva, the season of the return, and we're going to get to Rosh Hashanah, which is the end of the month, the 29th through the, through the 1st, I think, is from a Sunday to a Tuesday, Rosh Hashanah is a 48-hour day, and then we're going to go all the way to the Feast of Tabernacles, which is harvest time for you and me, if you believe it and receive it, if you'll expect it. Come on, you don't get what you want, but you will get what you expect, right? That's, that's, that's life. You, you know, I get what I water. I get the seed I plant and water is what gives, comes the increase in my life. If, if all I do is complain, then I just keep harvesting. Whatever you talk, let's say it this way. Whatever you speak to, you give life to. If you talk about your doubt and your unbelief, it'll grow. If, if you talk about lack, you know, it'll grow. But Jesus, the first thing that he preached when he, he said, the spirit of God is upon me, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he's anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. You don't need to be. This, you know, God is not, you know, God says this in Psalm 115. He said, I want to increase you more and more, you and your children. Believe him for increase. You know, his, God's will is not a, a small church. God's will is an, an abundant church. God's will is not lack and debt. You know, God, so let's, let's agree with him, shall we? You know, God, God's will is for thousands upon thousands of people to get saved in this city. You, you know, that's his will. And uh, so we need to get in agreement with that. He said, come and let us reason together. He said, come and speak my word back to me. He said, I didn't forget. Come on. He said, put me in remembrance. He didn't forget. He's saying, in putting him in remembrance, you're putting yourself in remembrance of who you are in Christ, right? 
But anyway, in chapter 30 uh, of uh, Deuteronomy, Moses' covenant number 4, verses 1 through 10, it shall come to pass when all these things have come upon you and the blessing and the curse, which and you can read Deuteronomy 28 and catch up with that if you want to later. He said they'll come, they come to mind among all the, all the nations whether the Lord your God has driven you and you shall return. See, this is the season of return. The season of return. And when they go into Yom Kippur on the 10th day of, of uh, history, when they go into that that tenth day, the high priest goes in before the Lord twice that day, once on behalf of himself and his family, and once on behalf of the nations. And when he goes in the second time, he, he, you know, he, well, both times he has to be he has to be ceremonially cleansed and all that kind of stuff. But when he goes in there, and he he represents the nation of Israel. And when he prays, he's not praying for their past; he's praying for the next year. See, God is always future-minded, right? God is always looking ahead, and, and the church is always looking, you know, and maybe you are always looking back. God said, I want you to look ahead. Watch, wh look where you're going. You know, I'll clear a path for you if you watch where you're going. So the high priest goes in there uh, once a year, but now Hebrews 4, 16, well, first of all, um, Revelation 1, 5, and 6 says that you are a priest and a king unto your Lord. Uh, Peter 2, 9 says that you are a royal king, priesthood, so your job now is to go into, the, into that place on behalf of the nation of Canada, on behalf of your friends. He says in Hebrews 4.16 that you were to come boldly. And so boldly means you can't come in there snotting and bawling. You can't come in there crying and get an audience with God because Hebrews 11 and verse 6 says, without faith it's impossible to please him. You, he's a faith being. He's not mean. He's a faith being. And he wants you to come by faith because you could never keep the law. You know, you got into this covenant the same way Abraham did in Genesis 15, and verse 6. Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. You know, faith faith is the key. The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. Four times he wrote it in the Bible. It's important. So, so I have to come boldly. I'm not coming in, oh, God, you know what I did last week. And, oh, God. Does that sound like a son and a king? When my son comes over to my house, he walks over to the fridge and helps himself. If he doesn't, I'm not going to help him. <laughs> I'm not going to say, Joe, would you like to have something to eat? I can look at him and know he's hungry. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, but he's got, a, he's got, he's family. He doesn't have to walk around, to sneak around the house and all of that like Christians do, sneaking around the things of God. Oh, if he only finds out what I did. Look, before you did it, he knew it. Before you did it. You, you, you think what you did surprised him? He went, oh, Father, did you see what they just did? He's known everything about you from the foundation of the world. And he loves you. Like a, like, like, like a, a, a normal father would love a normal child. That kind of love. Only much greater than that, right? So, um, so, okay. So he says, return unto the Lord your God and obey his voice. Well, that's not mysterious either, is it? Obeying his voice is not a mysterious thing. I wrote this down in, in, in a, a leaf of my Bible. Grace prospers where people follow God's instructions, not out of religious ob obligation, but out of honor and respect. You know, I, I honor God with my substance. I, I don't, I'm not given because of a, a religious obligation. I, 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 I try to, my best to honor him with my life because he said he'd lead me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. If he's leading me, I can go right. If I lead myself, I'm going to need GPS, God's positioning system, to correct me and turn me around. How many of you use GPS? How many of you have missed an exit? Did you pull off the side of the road and quit and say, that's it, I'm not doing this anymore? <laughs> no, that's what happens in church. You know, people miss it and they say, no, I can't go back there. Oh, dear God, I can't go back there after what I've done. Man, I tell you, this is the place you need to be. He said, boldly unto the throne room of grace to obtain mercy, to find grace. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm seeking his mercy and his grace. That's really Matthew 6, 33. Seeking first. I'm seeking his mercy. I'm seeking his grace. I found out that I can't get out of debt on my own. I found out that maybe you can. Maybe maybe you can. But, you know, the, my Bible says, 
that if I don't do it his way, my money could be in a bag with holes in it. Or he might blow on my finances and want to watch it go away because I, I got it dishonestly. Or I got it out of his will by sacrificing my family on the altar of my success. You know, success can be an idol too. We think of idols that they worship back in the Old Testament. But, you know, idol worship is, is happening big time today. And again, make sure you're not in idol worship by looking at where your money goes, where your time goes, where your talent goes. It, you know, it's not a judgment. It's like, hey, I need a course correction here. Go watch the movie Overcomer and see how a guy sick in bed corrected a pastor. It's awesome. Anyway, you shall return unto the Lord your God and obey his voice. Verse 3, then, that then the Lord your God will turn your captivity now, I know he's already, he preaches deliverance to the captive, but how many of you know lots of Christians are still held captive? I mean, I know they're not supposed to be. I know they're not. But, you know, still captive by a habit or something because they keep trying to fix it themselves. Well, that's it. That's the last time I'm going to do that. Yeah, until tomorrow. If you depend on, the, on yourself to get right, you'll be self-righteous anyway, and we wouldn't be able to stand you. No, no, people that, uh, people that are really strict and rigid with themselves become self-righteous. You don't want to be around them. Come on, you've met some of them in church. They don't even say God, right? It's God, G-A-W-D. <laughs> Thou knowest all this thing is Godest. And they pray. It's really weird. They don't talk to God. They've got this King James thing happening. And it sounds so, sounds so like Saul of Tarsus before he became Paul the Apostle. Yeah. So he said, I'll return your captivity. I'll have compassion upon you. Return and gather you from all the nations where you've been scattered. Verse 5. And the Lord your God will bring you into the land. We, you know, we have land. You have land that God wants to bring you into. It may be spiritual. It, you know, it may not be the promised land, but it is the promises land. It's exceeding great and precious promises that you can partake of his divine nature land. That's a good land to be in. To partake of his divine nature is a good land. How many of you say, that's a good place? It's not a physical place, it's a spiritual place, like we learned from Ashton last night. She said she was standing in the wrong line to get her hot dog and french fries. <laughs> and those things are important <laughs> when you're hungry. <laughs> the guy said, you're in the wrong line, and so she went like this. <laughs> Ephesians 2, 6, you are seated in heavenly places in Christ. Take your seat. If you're down there with, with Goliath wrestling in the valley, you don't need to be. Just throw something from the throne. Throw something from the throne. Throw the word at him. Five small stones. Throw the grace at him. And, and, and then just take your seat. Just take your seat. You don't need to be fighting Goliath. You don't need to be fighting any giants. If Ecclesiastes 8 4 says, The king makes decrees and they come to pass. You'll never see a king after he said something running around trying to make it happen. I declare that I'm debt free in the name of Jesus according to Luke 4, 18. And then go out and get three jobs trying to make it happen. No, find out, get God's instructions. Say, God, what is it that you would have me to do? And do that. You know, and, 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 and you'll know this, you'll know this for sure, that everything has to be moderate with God. If you're extreme in anything, then you need, you need balance in your life. Like Shirley was talking about last night. Surely doesn't, have, you know, I got a book in my office, I'm going to give it to you. It's about 150 pages on how to say no. <laughs> it's amazing that you have to, somebody had to write a, pay, a book on how to say no. No, because we don't want to hurt anybody, we don't want to hurt anybody, no. Oh no, I'll just, you know, I'll just comply. And the next thing you know, you're being used like a doormat, and it's not right. And then where's God's time when your time is all tied up? Time, talent, treasure. I should write a book. Time, talent, treasure. Three things. Just three things God requires of me. And he doesn't require all my time either. I can go for a ride on my motorcycle before I go and say, Lord, do you need me to do something for you before I go? If not, hop on and I'll take you for a ride. Right? Yeah, because he enjoys motorcycles. You know what, I, how I know that? Because I enjoy motorcycles. He enjoys what I enjoy. He's fun God. He likes to get down like Justin does when he gets home and play with the kids on the floor. Teach them how to do f front flips. 
and the trampoline, trampoline, they were doing it down the hallway here earlier this morning. No, but that's what a father does. Your father loves you. He wants to hang with you. He wants to have fun with you. How do you know that? Because Zephaniah chapter 3 says he rejoices over you with singing. And you're there. And he's running all over the place trying to entertain you. And you're going, oh, God. Oh, God, please fix my mess. He said, get the message. You don't have a mess. Add the age on the end of it. It's not a mess. It's a message. Get a message from me. Jeremiah 33, 3. A call on me and I will answer you and do great and mighty things that you couldn't even believe. He, come on, Ephesians chapter 3. Exceedingly, abundantly, above all your pea brain can ask or think. If pea brain offends you, I apologize. But compared to God, you do have a pea brain. No, no, we try to figure out God with our heads. Are you kidding me? The creator of the universe and you're going to figure him out? Good luck with that. Anyway, we're trying to get through Deuteronomy chapter 30. He said, the Lord will bring you into the land your fathers possessed. You shall, you, you shall possess it. He will do you good. Look at this. And what? That doesn't say add. He says, my desire is to multiply you. It, it personally, financially, as a church. God wants to multiply every church in this city. He didn't want them, you know, the small church mentality. No, no, it's division is what it is. You know, divide and conquer. The devil knows how to play that game really well. And, and he's been playing that over the church for years. And so I even talked to a guy one day in the gym, and he said, I believe in small churches. I said, then you don't believe the Bible. I mean, Moses, the first pastor, he had three million people in his congregation. Now, you know, he might have been believing for a small church. <laughs> but not you, not you and your four people that won't agree with anybody else in the city. He said, I learned, I'm learning how to submit to a pastor. I said, who's your pastor? He said, oh, we don't have one yet. <laughs> I said, it's probably easy for you right now then, is it? Yeah. Yeah, I said, you'll, I said, and I, I don't mind talking straight to people. I said, you'll make it until he corrects you one time, and then you'll be gone. And if you're not gone, you'll cause strife. And the Bible says where there's strife, there's confusion and every other evil work. And if I was your pastor, I'd throw you out because the Bible says, throw out the scorner and the strife will cease. And I was talking to him in love. You might think I wasn't. It doesn't sound like love, does it? You're trying to save a guy from himself, right? Hallelujah. He doesn't talk to me anymore. <laughs> no, he doesn't. I tried to talk to him the other day, and he said, I I'm focused on my workout. I can't talk to you right now. <laughs> you know who I'm talking about, right, Joe? <laughs> he won't talk to me anymore, and it's a good thing. It's quiet in the gym. It's good. <laughs> Verse 9. Now, this is God's heart when talking. And the Lord will make you plenteous in goods in every work of your hand, the fruit of your body, the fruit of your cattle, the fruit of your land for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over you for good as he rejoiced over your fathers. Verse 19. I call heaven and earth to record over you this day. I set before you life and blessing, death and cursing. Choose life. Choose life that you and your seed may live. I'm going to give you a choice between life and death, and I call heaven and earth to witness the choice that you make, is what it says in the Hebrew. I'll, re I'll read it to you again. I'm giving you a choice between life and death, and I will call heaven and earth to witness the choice that you make. And again, we, li we live by choice and not by chance. You know, in the Hebrew Bible, you cannot find a word coincidence because it doesn't exist. There's choice, every making choices. Do things happen by chance? No, things happen by the will of God or the will of the devil, depending on who's, who's you know, he said, whoever you yield your members to, you be the servant of. You can yield your tongue to the devil and trash your church and trash your life, or you can yield it to the, to the love of God and say, 
this, I'm, I'm walking in the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, and temperance. And against that, there's no law. Now, just I need to go back to, I need to go back to um, Matthew chapter 5 to find out where I'm going next. Verse 14 says, you're, you are the light of the world. So if you're waiting for some big evangelist to come and save your city, um, you're here now. It, no, no, it, you are the light of the world. Matter of fact, I was uh, sharing with a couple of fellows in the Curtado coffee shop yesterday. If you haven't been there, you haven't had coffee yet. And uh, it's the best coffee in this city. A anyway, we were in there and we were talking to a couple of young guys from a Bible school up in New, up in New Brunswick somewhere, uh, a Wesleyan Bible school. And um, in talking to them, I was giving my testimony, and I said, you know, I was sitting in the drug dependency center, not doing all that well, and uh, and uh, <laughs> with a whole room full of other people that weren't doing very well. And uh, we were sitting there, and we were all sick. One guy was watching a snake come out the wall socket, and another, another big Indian chief, he was hallucinating, and I had a croquet mallet behind me, and I said, if he comes near me, I'm going to knock him in the head. Because uh, because he was big and I didn't want to get hurt and I weighed about 120 pounds I was all drugged out and drug out and uh, anyway they, they at night they would bring people into Narcotics Anonymous and Alcoholics Anonymous to talk to us and uh, I noticed the difference right away some people would come in and they'd be well my family's coming home I haven't seen them in three or four years and I'm afraid that I will whatever then there's other guys. I called them alcoholics victorious because they would stand up and they'd say, they wouldn't talk about higher, higher power. They'd say, I just want to thank my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And, and there was such a difference in them. But I noticed they had a light in their face that the other guys didn't have. Like you might not notice it and you, you may be used to it now. But I guarantee you that people outside of your, outside the kingdom, they see, they see it on you. They see the light. Matter of fact, I remember one day in the gym, I was having a really rotten day. And this girl come up to me and said, what is it about you? You're always so happy. I was ready. Anyway, so, but, but, but again, you know, God can even confuse them. <laughs> if, he needs, if he needs to. You are the light of the world. Put it up on light, you know, light it up. The only reason you don't light it up is because you got guilt or shame for some dumb thing that you did. Light yourself up. Stand up like Peter did on the day of Pentecost and say, I never did anything 50, 50 days ago. I've never denied the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm a new creation. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. And I want to tell you what you need to do because I did it. And so he preached to them and 3,000 people got saved. That's not a bad day in the kingdom. But, but only a free man can do that. Only somebody that's been justified by faith and has right standing with God the Father can do that. You can't do that if you, you know, what if they find out what I did and all this kind of stuff. No, no, you just got to get up there and let her go, man. You're new. He said, a light on a hill that can't be hidden. He said, you don't, put, you don't take a candle and stick it under a basket, unless you want a fire, of course. But, but you put the candle, you set it up somewhere to give light to everybody that's in the house. That's what happens when we all come to church, too. That's what happened in here last night. There was light in the house. God moved in the house. We had a bunch of guest speakers here last night, and every one of them was awesome because the Holy Ghost was leading and directing the service. And that's what we're going to be doing this third Saturday of every month. We're coming in here, and we don't have any agenda, nothing. We're just going to come in here and see what he does. And if he doesn't do anything, which I'd be surprised, but if he didn't, we just go home and come back again next month right so you don't have to try and make anything happen but I want to get I'm trying to go somewhere here now verse 16 let your light so shine before men that they may see that they might see your good works that's good they're going to see something they're going to see your good works and glorify your father which is in heaven verse 17 is my verse think not that I came to destroy or obliterate the law or the prophets he said, I didn't come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill the law. 
He didn't, and so people have this idea that the law has passed away. But every one of the eight commandments, eight covenants that he made, he's a covenant keeping God. He hasn't broken one of them. He fulfilled the law. It fulfilled simply means to carry out to the full. It means justified. It means lined up with heaven. And so I, I like to compare the law to, even though I've been redeemed from the curse of the law, Galatians 3, 13, 14, says I've been redeemed from the curse of the law. Christ made a curse for me. The curse of anyone hangs on upon a tree that the blessing of Abraham would come upon me, this Gentile. I look upon that as like the laws of aerodynamics. Like I'm above the law now. I'm flying above the law, like the law of gravity. But the law of gravity is still there. It wasn't done away with. It's still there. It's just I'm living by a higher law. Matter of fact, in Romans 8, 1, it says, there's no condemnation to them in Christ Jesus who walk after the spirit, not after the flesh. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. But then if you back it up into Romans chapter 6, and says if you yield your members, you could end up not under the law, but getting the results of the law. That's why First John 1, 9, I don't know about you, but I keep it in my pocket. I keep the promises of God in my pocket because I don't always get it right. I know that most of you do, but I'm still working on it, and that's why you pray for me. Amen. Amen. So, you know, he made, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you the eight covenants that are in place. And, um, no, actually, I'm going to give you the, the six that are unconditional. And then we're going to look at a couple of them, probably not today, maybe one today. Uh, number one is Adam after the Garden of Eden. After, because, because in the Garden of Eden, he was given a covenant that was conditional. But after the Garden of Eden... God told Adam what he was going to do. There's a seed coming out of the woman that's going to crush the devil's head and that's and that take his authority back and that's a done deal. And the next one is Moses with the Ten Commandments. I mean, that those Ten Commandments, we'd like to think that they're not there, but they are in this. He said, I'll write my commandments on the table or the, the table of your heart. And the commandments now are love your neighbor. No, first of all, love God with all your heart, soul, Mind, strength. Okay, okay. just think about that. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. Love God with all your time. Love God with all your talent. Love God with all your treasure, right? You say it that way. And then he says, love your neighbor as yourself. And that's a twofold thing because you can't love anybody until you love yourself. You can't respect anybody if you don't have any self-respect. I mean, it's really difficult to do those things. So you need to be able to look in the mirror and say, I love you. You're created in the image and the likeness of God. And if you can't do it, keep doing it until you can. Get it. Get that and understand. God is love. Seek Mark 11, Matthew 6.33 this way. Seek first the kingdom of love and love's way of doing things. And all of these things will be added unto you. Seek first the kingdom of love. God is love. 1 John 4, 8 and 1 John 4, 15, God is love. He does not love. He is love. And so, and so I, can, I can, whenever I see God, I can substitute that word for love, can't I? And not be wrong. Love. So he gave those Ten Commandments, and they were under the law, and they were obligated to it, but we're not. We're not. We, we operate from a heart perspective. And that's another good thing, too, because God doesn't judge your actions. He judges your heart. And how many of you know that sometimes your actions don't line up with your beliefs? How many of you act ugly when you know better? Right? It's like a man, when he's ugly, he can't do anything about it. He's just born ugly, and he's ugly, but a woman can paint stuff and fix it up and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> It's getting bad, bad. Okay, let's uh, let's go to um, let's go to Genesis chapter fifteen. The 
covenant that God has with Abraham. Now, how many of you know that covenant is still active? He said he came to fulfill it. It's still active, but I've been redeemed from the curse of it. But the blessing, he said, that the blessing of Abraham would come upon us, the Gentiles, right? So in Genesis chapter 15, I love this story. I'm in Exodus 15. Didn't read right. I'm saying, what's Moses doing over there with Abraham? It's not supposed to be over there. Genesis 15. Where are you? After these things, it starts out, after what? After the last 14 chapters. <laughs> after this. <laughs> After No, but the cool thing about God is he called out Abraham, Abram, from Ur of the Chaldees and didn't tell him where he was going. How many of you would go? Not only did he call, tell him where to go and, and told him to go alone, but he, did, he didn't know it, but there wasn't any jobs there. So God sent him to a place where there was no employment. God sent him to a place where he had no friends. God sent him to a place where he had no family. He waited till hearing that his father died off before he ended into the place. And then God comes to him and says in Genesis 12, he, he said, he said I, I know that Nimrod and those guys back in Genesis chapter 10 were going to make names for themselves. But he said, I'm going to make, I'm go, I'm make you. I, you follow me and I will make you. I will make your name great. He said, and I will bless those that bless you and curse those that curse you. He said, I'm going to bless you so that the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. Now think about it. Genesis, that's, that's, that's the promise to Abraham. God said, I want to bless you so that you can be a blessing that the nations can be blessed. The church has been sold a lie because of a misunderstanding of the word of God. Re trying to read a, a, a Middle Eastern book with a, a Western mindset thinking that it's good to be poor, thinking that God doesn't want you blessed. And like I'm telling you, if you read it with, a, with the understanding of Rabbi Jesus instead of the Jesus that you think you know, the, the Baptist, Southern Baptist Jesus with the sheep on his shoulder and a cookie sheet on fire over his head carrying a sheep, doesn't look anything like a Jew. That's how misled the church is. This guy's Jew to the bone, and the way he taught was that way. You know, when he said, when he said uh, uh, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, they were saying, wow, you're talking about my covenant with you. You're talking about my covenant. I don't need to be struggling trying to get these things. I've got a covenant. Like the woman all, all bowed over for 18 years, Jesus looked at her and said, ought not this woman be in bowed low these that Satan has bound, that Satan has, you want to know where sickness comes from? Where That Satan has bound low these 18 years? Ought not she be loosed from her infirmity, being a daughter of Abraham? Jesus taught and said, healing is the children's bread, and the church is the sickest thing you ever saw on the planet. Because we don't understand the covenant. If we understood the covenant, you know, he said, put me in remembrance. What, of how sick you are? No, put me in remembrance of my covenant. By the stripes of Jesus, I am healed and made whole. Come boldly into the throne room of grace and declare your covenant rights. John 15, 7, if you abide in me and I, my words abide in you, you will demand I tell you, you will demand what you will and it shall be done unto you. You're not demanding it from God. You're demanding it based on the blood that he shed at Calvary. I'm here because you shed your blood and gave me this covenant. And I'm here declaring my covenant right to prosperity. My covenant right to health in Jesus' name. He said, up until now you've asked nothing in my name. Ask that you might receive that your joy might be full. You ever see a happy church? Yeah, I have. There's happy people in here. But I've seen the miserable church, too. I went to the crying church when I first got saved. Every Sunday night, they'd have a crying service up at the front. They'd bawl and snot and go on. I mean, it was like, it was like, it was all religious crap. You know, trying to act spiritual, trying to get God to move. And I'm saying God, wouldn't, God wasn't even there. Without faith, it's impossible. He doesn't go there. He hadn't been there in years. That's why they talk about their stained glass windows. They built a monument because the move went. 
the move that built the building went, and now all they got is a monument. They're mon- they're, they're, it's, like, it's like being a museum caretaker. We're here just taking care of the museum. <laughs> yeah, yeah. but let me tell you about what it was years ago. No, don't tell me about that. I'm not living years ago. I'm living right now. I can go back to 110 Thorn Avenue and tell you some awesome stories. I'm expecting that the rest of my life is the best of my life. You can't live, you can't mourn something that you left behind. You left it behind because God wanted it behind you. <laughs> Trying to get over the past. No, just get over the past by stepping on the gas pedal. I can get away from my past in a hurry. Put some real estate between me and then. Amen. And put a grin on my face and say, God, I enter into your gates with thanksgiving, into your courts with praise. I don't come in whining and complaining about things that aren't going right in my life. Like even God must want to say, would you just shut up? (laughs) You know how tired I am of you crying like that? I know I'm long suffering, but it's running out. (laughs) You're standing on my last set of nerves right now. And you do not want to get me upset. Okay. You're... <laughs> Aren't you glad you're not God? You'd smoke some people, wouldn't you? <laughs> Here they come again with that complaint. <laughs> now, when we had a bigger church, we had a couple hundred people in the church. I had guards. They were, they were, they were called security. Because their job was to keep Nellie negative from pouring her trash in my ear before I preached. <laughs> You've never met Nelly Negative, I know. Maybe you're it. I don't know. What that is. <laughs> rejoice in the Lord. Come on, you guys were at the jail, right? Where Paul the Apostle wrote, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. Rick Renner said you can still smell it when you get into one some of those places because the sewage used to run through. Yeah. So when it's called dungeon, it means done. It means poop goes downhill and you're down in the bottom and you're shackled in it. And you're standing there saying, Rejoice in the Lord always. Can I say rejoice? Rejoice, rejoice. Hey, Silas, sing, buddy. This is the day. Sing those old Pentecostal songs. It's the day that the Lord has made. The part about that story in Acts chapter 16 I really like is it says, and the prisoners heard them. They weren't praying over their food like you do in the restaurant. They were loud because they had a revelation of the forgiveness and the love of God. Amen. So here in chapter 15, and, um, and we'll close with this because I took up too much time talking about other stuff. <laughs> time, talent, treasure. God wants to destroy the things that you used to believe. And he starts with Abram this way, and he says, after these things, after he moved out of Ur of the Chaldees, after he separated himself from Lot, sometimes God has to take people out of your life. You, you might mourn over them, but you really need to rejoice if he's, you know, because it just means that they're not a part of your destiny. They may have been there temporarily and they may have been a great ass, asset to you or just an ass to you or whatever that works. <laughs> asset, I mean, I didn't mean to say that. You don't talk like that in church or even at home. Okay. <laughs> He appeared unto him in a vision. That means, that, and that means that's the way that he can appear to you too. Like I had him come in my house one time, and, uh, and uh, it was a vision. It, uh, he wasn't. Well, he's he's here personally all the time, but I had a vision. So anyway, it says he said, and notice how he always starts out with you, with me. Fear not, because our natural, what we got from Adam, is fear. I, I heard you in the garden, and I ran and I hid myself. That's. That's what man does when he messes up. Instead of going boldly to the throne room of grace, you run and hide. You cut yourself off from other Christians, and you think you're being insulated, but you're really being isolated. The devil loves to watch watch the Discovery Channel and watch what those gaz- g- gazelles and wildebeests do. Watch how the lions hunt them down. Separate one from the herd and then eat them. 
The devil goes around as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Stay in the group. Matter of fact, get right in the middle of it. Get up to the front because you don't want to be near the back. That's why it's not good to sit in the back of the church. Those of you sit in the back of the church, watch out the lion. <laughs> the lion. <laughs> no, it says he, he goes around as a roaring lion. There is a lion called the lion of the tribe of Judah, and that's, that's whose you are. So don't let the, the, the false lion gum you to death because he has no teeth. Okay. And Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me? So, so he, no, he starts out here in covenant. I need, to, I need to read verse 1 again. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham saying, Fear not, I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. And I've explained this before. What he's saying is, I am your army. You're my farmer. You, you see time and harvest time. I am your army. I will protect you. I'm your shield and your exceeding great reward. And read it. It means rapidly increasing supply of finances. And I know that Abraham was doing okay because in Genesis 13, in verse 2, before this happened, it says that he was very rich with silver and gold. Oh, God wants you blessed rich spiritually, brother. Silver and gold is not spiritual. God wants you blessed. Do you understand that? Blessed. God wants you to prosper. Are you a prosperity preacher, Gary? No, I'm a preacher that prospers. Hallelujah. I'm your shield, your exceeding great reward. And Abraham, and Abraham, Abram knew that this covenant wasn't just for him. When God makes a covenant, it's eternal. That's why all eight of these covenants are still in place. You, you know, and that's why the Bible would say all scripture is God breathed and for inspiration, correction, and instruction in righteousness. This whole, you, you know, if you're just reading the New Testament, I hear lots of people say you just read the New Testament because that's yours. No, if you understand the word of God, it's all yours from Genesis to maps. Yeah. And so you, you, can, you can glean from all of this. I, I know that primarily the church letters are Colossians, Ephesians, Galatians, Philippians. I understand that. But to, to leave the wealth that's in the Old Testament, not me. It's not even old. We call it the Old Testament. But God calls it the, the, a blood covenant. He said, I shed my blood for that covenant too. So he said, uh, and Abraham said, Lord, I don't have anybody in. He said, all I have in my house is Elijah of Damascus. Is he going to be my heir? Because this covenant goes on from generation to generation. That's why the Bible says you'll be a blessing to your children's children. When you're in covenant with God. You know, I found out when I was over in Pictou Island that my great-grandfather was active in the church over there. His name was Little Huey McCollum, little Scottish guy, but they had a plaque on the wall dedicated to him. And so, so I wonder how I ended up being a pastor from a drug addict. It was in my lineage. It was in my lineage. I go back on my mom's side, and my, her dad's name was Amos, and the, and the guy in front of him was Barnabas, and I mean, the, the guy in front of him had another Old Testament name and these guys and all the records that I read were church records because they didn't they were handwritten church records because they didn't have any other way of keeping track of things back then. So you don't know what happened in your family early on, but I, I guarantee you that somebody somewhere back there was preaching the gospel and praying for his generation to come. So he said, It's only Elijah of Damascus. Abram said, Behold, to me you have given no seed. And no one in my house is my heir. And the, Lord, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, you, These shall not be your heir, but one that comes out of your own bowels. So, but here's verse 5. He brought him forth abroad and said, Look now, and he'll say this to you too. Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if you're able to number them. He said, So shall your seed be. In another place he said, Look from where you are. Where, where's that? Is that in chapter 4? 14? It's, it's there somewhere. No. Some. 14, 14. I'd like to. Okay, let's go back and look at that. 13, 14. 13, 14. Okay. And the Lord said to Abraham, 13, 14, once he was separated from Lot. Once he was separated, anyway, that's a, a lot, is a whole other teaching. He could spend a couple of weeks right there. He could, seriously. And what, what Lot represented and all that. When Lot was separated from him, he said, lift up now your eyes 
which tells me he was looking down, which sounds like he was discouraged because he separated from his family member, like something happened. There was so much strife between them. There was so much strife between them that God had to separate them. Because where there is strife, there is confusion and every other evil work. So if there's any strife, you need to deal with it. You can't let it grow because it'll bring confusion in every other evil work. You got to nail strife like, like, like you'd s bug f flying around your head. Swat that thing and don't let it continue. So this is what he's saying there. He said, and so the Lord said to Abraham after Lot was separated from him, lift up now your eyes. And look from the place where you are. Okay, so Sunday morning, sitting at New Covenant Ministries Church, look from where you are, not look at where you are. He didn't say look at where you are. He said look from where you are. So in other words, you're expecting a positive change. Look from where you are. Hmm. Look north. Look south. Look east. Look west. For all, for, so with you and I, he would say, for all that you can see, I've already given to you. He said, look up, in, enlarge your vis vision. I'm able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you can ask or think. Matter of fact, I love that whole prayer in Ephesians chapter 3. He said, he bows his knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he grant unto you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ will dwell in your heart by faith, that you be rooted and grounded in love and able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the breadth, the depth, the height. Same thing he's saying to Abraham right now. He said that you could be filled with the fullness of God. You know, so many Christians going around, you know, he said, oh, to your belly will flow rivers of living water. And every now and again, a drip comes because the cup is so empty. David said, my cup runs over. Goodness and mercy, follow me all the days of my life. My cup is running over. He said, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water when you're full of the Holy Ghost. How do I get full of the Holy Ghost? By praying in other tongues, by keeping myself in the love of God. Being full of the Holy Ghost. When you're full of the Holy Ghost, it'll bubble out on everybody. When you're full of other stuff, I want you to know that leaks out too. If you're full of strife and confusion and division, and you spill that all over everybody, I wonder why they're upset with you. The love of God is shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Ghost. The Holy One is living on the inside of you. Access Him. The same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in me and quickens my mortal body. I yield my right of way to the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost lived through me. I've, not, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Little I moved out and big Christ moved in. Little I's gone. Gone. So I'm not saying he doesn't sit up in the coffin. But I recognize him now, and I put a stake in his heart and say, get back down there. Just like, no, no, just like, just like a vampire. You back? I thought you were dead. I know, none of you have an ugly thing going on. That's good. He said, all the land that you can see, I will give it to you and your seed forever. In other words, he's saying, whatever is revealed to you is yours. Whatever you can get revelation knowledge on, you can have. How do I get revelation knowledge? Peter said it, Paul said it this way. If you'll consider your understanding. If you'll think about the message that you're hearing this morning, revelation will come. If you walk out and say, well, that was good. Now it's Sunday afternoon. Let's go party or do whatever you're doing. I'm not saying that's wrong, but I'm saying don't forget. You know, James 1.22, don't forget the word. Be a doer of the word of God and not a forgetful hearer because if you forget, you deceive yourself. There's so many self-deceived Christians because they don't do what they hear. If you hear, how many of you know that when you hear something that rubs you the wrong way, you really needed to hear that? If the message steps on your toes, then you need toe healing. You know, you need to get your toes out of the aisle. You need to get yourself out of the way. You know, God loves you. God, God will do what it takes to get to you. He will do what it takes to get to you. Don't be like that guy in Cornerbrook, Newfoundland. What a sad story. Or in Gander, Newfoundland, rather. No. Yeah. Anyway, don't be like that guy. That, you know, I'm glad he made heaven, but he missed earth. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. He lifts, uh, lift, missed all the earth. Sitting backslidden. If you're a backslider now, you're watching us uh, on, you know, on whatever this is, <laughs> live stream, <laughs> YouTube. It's so easy just to ask Jesus to be Lord of your life again. David said it this way, renew a right spirit in me, God. David said, against you and against you only have I sinned. He didn't have to think about everything that he ever had, had done to anybody. He said, my sin is not acknowledging you as my Lord and Savior. I do that right now, and I thank you for coming back into my life. I thank you for Teshuvah. I thank you for Acts 3 and verse 19, that I repent, and my sins are obliterated, and I get seasons of refreshing from your face, oh God, that you put your mouth on my mouth and breathe new life into me today. In Jesus' name, amen. I, I'm going to have to stop here. I really am. It's like, it's, 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 the time is going away. And um, we were just getting into the covenant with Abraham. But in order to do this, I'd need another 20 minutes or 25 minutes. And um, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that because we were here last night. I'm not going to do that because it's a sunny day in September. And um, you need to get out and enjoy your day. And so, so bless you. I, I don't want to close without giving the, you an opportunity. If you're here and you don't know Jesus, uh, we'd like to introduce you to him. And uh, it's so easy to get saved. You just believe in your heart and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. And you're saved. It's so easy. Uh, you know, you, you, maybe your thought life makes it difficult, but it's so easy. When you ask him to come into your life, he will zoom in there. I promise you he will come in. And if you're here today and you need healing in your body, then we fully believe what he said in Mark chapter 16, that we would lay hands on the sick and he would cause them to recover. So if that's you today, we, we are definitely standing in faith for your healing. And, if, and so you just come on up now and we'll pray with you. And, you know, go to John chapter 5 and try to be the first one to get in the water. First one in the water. Something that I noticed when I was reading Genesis chapter 22 one time is when God asked Abraham to do something, the Bible uses the word hineni, and it means he ran to the commandment. And uh, I saw that in the life of Keith Moore when he served uh, Kenneth Hagin. When Kenneth Hagin said, uh, Keith, could you come here now? He would run from wherever he was. And they said, why do you always run? He said, because I want to honor the man of God. And when you think about honoring the man of God, that's something that's long gone from the church. You know, the matter of fact, I was talking to a pastor that pastored a very large church at one point, uh, Pastor Ted Uke, and he said, you know, he said they used to honor my office, and now they would tell me to. And I thought, that's, but it's the disrespect that's in the whole nation right now anyway so but Keith Moore would do what Abraham did he ran to the commandment he wanted to be quick to obey be, matter of fact the Bible says be swift to hear and slow to speak right and so w w lots of times we're slow to speak only because we're waiting for you to finish your story so we can tell a better one or we're waiting to hear your opinion my opinion come out of your mouth right I, I, I you need to agree with me or I'm going to fight with you.
full of angels. You can see the people in here. You can't see the angels. But everybody brought at least one. Cyril Sparkle's got about 10 with him that have been with him his whole life, just trying to keep him alive. It's true, though. It's true. He's given angels charge over you to keep you in all of your ways. He's given angels charge over you to keep you. To keep you. The angels are there to keep you. The keeping power of God is in his angelic host that are with you, around you, traveling with you, watching you. Psalm 103 and verse 20 says, They hearken unto the voice of God's word. And when you speak God's word, they will move as long as they're not confused. They will move as long as they're not confused. That you continually say the right thing, they will move on the right thing. There'll be no confusion in your tongue. There'll be no confusion in your mind. You'll be Isaiah 26, 3, trusted in him. Kept in perfect peace because your mind is stayed upon him. Your mind, your heart, everything is trusting in God. And your flesh is just a noise. It's just annoying noise sometimes. But you don't trust your circumstance, you trust your God. You don't trust your circumstance, you trust your God. Because he's faithful. He's so faithful. Hallelujah. 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 you all for coming. Thank you for being with us as we process the building that we're in and make the changes that are necessary to make it better for you. And thank you for the praise and worship today. As it was last night, it was... You know, I used to go in the bars downtown to hear music and, well, whatever else you do in the bars downtown. But, you know, coming here on a Saturday night, like, like you can't top... Well, he can, but you can't talk. Last night to me was, it was like, ah, God, this is so good. This is so rich. Anyway, God bless you, and we'll see you on um, Thursday.